So if they ended up calling the owner of the feedlot directly, say, yeah, send me your money and I'll send it to the vet. Well, that horse would never get seen, keep the money. When I first came there, they didn't use feed buckets. Carry a bag of grain in, pour it in a line on the ground, let the horses fight over it. Those horses stand there out in those back pastures, even in barns, in the stalls, and they die until they're taken out back and buried. People saw what I saw, <laughs> like, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't support the kill pen at all. started working for a local kill pen, um, thinking I was giving horses a second chance, and quickly, very quickly realized that wasn't how it happened. I worked at a very horrific feedlot for about six months, and I'm gonna be sharing with you guys everything that I learned firsthand while I was there. I was their longest employee in 10 years of being in business. Six months was their longest employee ever. So they treated people and the animals horribly. Um, but the first thing I noticed when I went there is they'd, they'd be posting online that horses are going to slaughter and then go telling us to get slinkies on them because they're sending them down to Atala, Alabama or Bowie or Elkhart or um, Kelowna, literally anywhere there's an auction happening when they want to sell some horses and get money. So then all these people online were sending them money like Buku and donating to them to help to pay for the vet care for the horses. And that's so many, so many times because they have personal horses too. So when you donate money to these places and they say they're getting this horse vet care, it's very likely like nine times out of 10 when I was there, that horse that was paid for the vet care didn't get it, but a personal horse did get it or the medications were just saved for a horse in the future that got hurt. So the feedlots got horses from all around, any auction where they could get a cheap horse, any owner who posted their horse for sale that was local, even shipping, they um, sent haulers out to Georgia if there was enough horses for them to pick up and they'd send them back if they thought they could make that money on them. Um, and then once the feedlot couldn't sell those horses, they'd claim that they're shipping to slaughter. And then anybody and their mother goes and starts sending them money and half the time these people would donate all these funds to one person so that this horse can go to some other person who can't pay for it, can't help it. And um, I mean, it was just, it was all around horrible. They got donations for feed because people thought they were rescuing and helping horses. Then they go out sending me out to buy four tons of feed for the feed lot. And um, all of it was the Purina, what was sent back from them. Um, like the damaged grain or molded grain or corn in a bag, horse grain. And um, yes, yeah, so they were getting the cheapest feed for the ones that did get feed. And I mean, all the things that happened there, like none of the horses were taken care of. There were times where everyone else quit and I was one person taking care of 300 horses out there. Uh, we had horses come in that were lame as could be. They'd drug them or wild horses that were definitely not broke, run them around, give them some drugs and do a two minute video. So people think that it's just an amazing, well-broke horse, and then they buy it, find out it's the complete opposite. So yeah, not only were they not shipping to slaughter, but they, everything they did was just complete lies. I mean, just like anybody can go and see a horse posted for sale and buy it, those traders were doing the exact same thing, except for they say like, I'm gonna be a great home for it, you know, and tell someone whatever they wanna hear, and then they buy it, and the next thing you know, that horse that was being taken care of is on its way to a trader to be passed around five more times and just get sick and catch diseases. Um, and that was another thing. Those That facility, the feedlot that I worked at, they were a breeding ground for diseases. So we got in, we, we had a pen one time, it was C13, and that was where the skinny horses went. Well, we got a new horse that was skinny, so we put it in there. 
had strangles. He knew it had strangles. And they, the feedlot owner still told us, put it out in there, it'll be fine. Well, and then, you know, about two weeks later, all these other horses are getting these big old nodules under their jaws. So they offered somebody $1,000 to buy all five horses because they had too many horses. They had too many horses at the time. And uh, that lady came from New Mexico, picked those horses up, no Coggins, no health, certic health certificate, hauled them all the way from East Texas back out to New Mexico. Nothing on them, no, no flesh on them, nothing. And um, yeah, that was like normal stuff. That was not the first time. We did have vet, uh, vet days weekly almost, and farrier days with the farrier came out too. And that was actually, that was the one thing that was a little bit surprising. The vet did end up quitting completely. The way it worked, so with the feedlot, someone who would buy a horse from the feedlot, but like lived out of state and had to ship it and they had to get their paperwork, they would call the vet directly to make an appointment. That's what they were supposed to do. So if they ended up calling the owner of the feedlot directly, say, yeah, send me your money and I'll send it to the vet. Well, that horse would never get seen, keep the money, and the person would have no idea. And you see, when you deal with hundreds of horses a week, you got Coggins for a Palomino mare, a Bay mare, a Bay gelding. You got Coggins for any horse you would need that are current. Just sends them on with another Coggins and tells them the health certificate's not finished yet. A lot of what they would buy wasn't, it wasn't healthy. It was either not broke or it had something medically wrong with it. That's, we maybe, maybe three times in the six months I was there, got a horse in that was genuinely like, this is an amazing horse, why is this here? And of course those were probably horses they paid five grand for at auction to make the others look better. We, we very rarely, when I worked at the feedlot, got in any sound horses, um, along with having no medical issues. That was not common at all. I mean, seeing, seeing stiff lame horses there became the average horse that you would see, because that's, out of 300 horses, there's maybe one that was completely sound and would pass a PPE and it's sane. <laughs> the rate too of how many horses they would get in and how many would actually make it out of the kill pen um, was extremely low being that they don't euthanize. Those horses stand there out in those back pastures, even in barns, in the stalls, and they die until they're taken out back and buried. If the horse isn't bought from there, it dies there. So it's never even had a chance to make it to slaughter because there's no way it could make the trailer ride there. The feedlots, they don't, they don't treat the horses right at all. Um, I mean, the one that I worked for, the feedlot, they didn't, they didn't care if the horses didn't have food and water. They'd let them go easily, days without it, until like, okay, horses are dropping dead, the police are coming, this isn't good. And then there's also the part of it where when you report it and you, you report the feedlot for the horse's sake to bring better health to them and get them out of the neglect that they're in, um, a lot of the law enforcement doesn't uphold the laws here. So they don't, it's livestock to them. They don't, they don't see it as living, breathing animals to take care of and get out of those situations. I'd probably guesstimate anywhere between 50 to 70 percent of those horses that came there died on site or shortly after leaving like within a week to two weeks of leaving I mean, we had we had a load of donkeys die on a trailer after they left when i was there i drug out over 70 80 horses easily um, and then they had goats they had dogs that died they had cats that the dogs used to kill and they kept trying to get cats for some reason some of the deaths that happened there were things that we knew and saw for months. Call the vet, let the vet see this horse for so long. He's bleeding out his nose everywhere, and a lady paid $5,500 for that horse. Um, was supposed to be shipped up to Oklahoma, but he got sick, and she waited about a month after he was sick, and I was begging her to call the vet. The feedlot waited, and um, they let her know two weeks before the horse passed away. Yeah, so the horse was turned out into a back pasture when it got really sick. Had finally seen the vet, and the vet who came out there was like, "This is beyond what I, beyond what I can do. Like, sorry, I, I have no idea what's going on here." Um, they thought he needed a guttural pouch cleaning. They sent him to another vet off of the property, and um, he died when he got there on the trailer. The 
first things that I started to pick up on um, was the dragging horses. And I, I didn't know that they were dragging horses, but I, I had a feeling something was going on. And I, at first I really did think like, maybe they just have an amazing trainer here because that horse was crazy 10 minutes ago and I'm watching this guy ride this horse around like it's the last year's cutting champion, world champion. Whenever we had a horse that wasn't broke or a mule, even donkeys or ponies, um, we'd always put them on the walker, fight to get them ready. If it was too hard, then they'd come out and drug them with either Guanabins or Ace. And um, if the horse was still a little bit wild after that, then they'd get on and we had a setup. So there was one row of pens here, another row of pens in the middle and another row. And they'd run them around that middle row, like a truck, just going in circles till that horse was dripping and sweating, tired, panting, head down in the dirt and uh, then they'd go in the arena and make the sale video for it and just say like, oh, it's really hot out here today or we just had to hose the horse off because it got all muddy to take away all the obvious signs that they had drugged this horse and the horse had been ran. Um, they had said that horses had broken penises because you know, whenever they're drugged, their sheaths just relax so everything hangs out, make up a full story for how oh, it was a stud, it got kicked, so they had to castrate it and this is just how he lives and that's, was never the case at all. They were they were drugged horses. So it, it did take me a while to find that out, but those were the first suspicions that had came up. So after that, we had a horse that had foundered. He, I mean, you could see straight up into every single one of his hoofs, everything in there. There was no soul on his hoofs at all. He died in the stall, no vet care, nothing at all, but he'd been there before I got there. So they had just told me like, oh, he was like this and the vet, the vet said he was getting better. This was so unexpected. And then it just got worse because the owner of the feedlots family started dropping off racehorses that they had just ran the legs off of. So these racehorses would come in and we always knew if it was the families because they wouldn't be tagged and their tattoos would be cut or burned off. So no one, no one could track them at all. No microchips cut out. That, that started happening really often. So that was when about three or four months in and I started taking all those notes of everything. Right around that time too, that was when I started taking pictures and recording everything, calling the police myself. And when the law enforcement started coming out to the feedlot after I had called them, they literally sat there and laughed with me, making fun of the people who had been calling and reporting the feedlot um, for the abuse that was very clearly happening. So I specifically showed the law enforcement when they came out empty water buckets in these pens. These horses haven't had food for days. You were called out here three days ago by somebody else, what's going on? And he's like, oh yeah, they got some food right there. See, they can eat that. It's obviously nothing on the ground. Um, and that, that's, that's a common thing for most of them. A lot of the other feedlot owners um, who run feedlots in the Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Texas area came out there quite a bit to swap horses with them too. So that was another thing where it really set in my head, okay, these horses are not going to slaughter at all. Um, and I actually saw one who I wanted to purchase myself because um, he was just an amazing horse. I saw him end up up in Oklahoma at that kill pen about a month after they had claimed that they sold him. Even the family members of the feedlot, they would come with their semi trucks and these were the ones that hauled at night because they're not legally allowed to haul, they're not even legally allowed to have a, over a personal amount of animals at all. Um, so they had to haul at night and they'd come in and they'd pick up a load of horse that we'd have all slinkied up, slicked off and shined, ready to go to Atala, Alabama. Not that, that was the most common because it's ran by other traders who do the same thing as them. So if they're doing the same thing, there's no one to hold them to the standards, a green light standard for a sand horse. You can pass anything off and no one's gonna, the people who, they run it and they make the rules they're not going to hold you to it um and that's exactly how it happened so many times so all the there were no biosecurity measures whatsoever if the feedlot wanted a horse up in the barn um, because someone was coming to look at it and they wanted it to look like it was a well-kept better taken care of horse we'd throw whatever horse was in there with pneumonia out put that horse back in, the horse with pneumonia would be forgotten in the pasture within a week. We had all the medications there. They were actually shipped from an out-of-state vet who the feedlot owner was friends with. And I mean, they, they could get any medications that they want, any medications at all. So a lot of the most common thing that we gave out would have been antibiotics. Exceed is what we would use. If they were thin or um, pasture point of like, yeah, that, that horse isn't papered, it's not pretty, no one's gonna buy it. 
throw it out in the back pasture, forget about it. Um, and not forget about it means like it's, it's going to die. There's nothing, yeah, there's nothing you can do. Giving medication to a horse, you'd always, you know, fill your syringe up, go give that horse a shot, whether it's a main line or um, IM, and then they'd go out and we always set the needle back down right on the counter. It's like it was, a, it was a known thing. There was nowhere to throw the needles away anywhere specific. We, didn't, we did not throw needles away. We got yelled at if we threw a needle away because then they'd have to buy more when nothing was wrong with that when it wasn't bent, it wasn't clogged. I mean, even if they switched medications, we'd be using the same, same. I mean, there were times they wanted us to pull out banamine with a syringe, give it to the horse, then pull out some dex, give it to the horse, and now let's go give it some exceed in the same syringe. If we had like three horses sick in one barn, we'd just use the same needle. I mean, that's everything that we were always instructed to do by them, knowing it wasn't right, but we'd get screamed out otherwise because it's a needle that's 75 cents, cost them that much money, that they, they didn't want to have to buy that. If any horse had anything in its blood, it would have easily been given to any other horses there from sharing bodily fluids because we didn't, each specific horse did not have their own needles at all. At the feedlot, they had um, an entire pen of ponies when I worked there. And um, we had about three studs in with all of the pony mares. So nearly every mare in there, if they could be bred, they were bred. Now, um, the one that I worked for also raised some specific breeds of horses and they would get mares in from auction. Like, oh, I don't have that color yet. Gotta go breed it to my spotted stud over there. See what color we get. And then all those horses are born and they're not taken care of. So a lot of times the dams would pass away, the foals would pass away, they would reject them. Um, or try to sell them, wean them early, and that foal wouldn't make it once it got to its new home. Feedlot wants me to sell more horses, get more money. No one needs to know this horse is bred if they don't want to buy it bred. But they'd always reach out to people in private to kind of get a feel for like, what, what are these people looking for? What do they want before posting anything? Sure. Trusted employees, those were the ones that she sent up to load horses out for people because they would sit here there and go like, yeah, this horse is amazing. It's not a problem at all. It's not lame. It's not gonna throw you through the sky. <laughs> yeah, the feedlot never let us who knew go up there and would say anything. A lot of, um, a lot of blind horses came in there. They prey on the people who don't know that you can't ship a blind horse. So they'd go online and get a video of it being chased around the pasture or a video of it running into walls with no idea what it's doing. And they'd say this horse is leaving on the trailer tomorrow if no one buys it from the feedlot. And so someone buys it from the feedlot and then they've got a horse that's very likely gonna kill them. They had sold a horse one time as a kid broke horse and it was returned because it flipped over, smashed the nine year old between a tree and the horse smashed her helmet wide open. And they, they came, they brought the helmet and everything because she, the feedlot doesn't take horses back. So they came, they brought that helmet and they were like, you're taking this horse back. We're like, it's gonna happen right now. Um, and now they also sold this one horse, his name was um, They sold him up to a lady, I believe in, and the lady had sent in fly boots, fly sheet, blanket, everything for this horse. She had no idea that this horse was insane. Barely green broke. I mean, like, spookiest horse I've ever been around. Um, and the feedlot didn't tell her that. They didn't warn her of everything. So she orders this horse and the hauler, he called her when he was picking the horse up and he said like, ma'am, I can't even get a halter on this horse without it losing its mind. And um, they told her, well, you're either getting the horse or you're getting nothing because you've already paid us. So she got the horse and and no one knows how that went, but that's no guaranteed situation when a horse isn't what it's supposed to be. In my time there, probably about 30 thoroughbreds died. Um, now we also, if we ever got thoroughbreds in that looked like liver kidney failure, would immediately call somebody, give them that horse for free and send them out. So the feedlot didn't, any horse that looks like it's gonna die immediately, they'd get it out immediately. We, we very rarely got thoroughbreds where you could read their tattoos still. It was more common than not, they were bur burned or cut off with microchips removed from their shoulder or their tail, um, or their hind end, but um, we, that was very rare. And normally if we could read their tattoos, the horse had won like 200 grand, but it was obviously hurt and couldn't do anything anymore. And, Saddest thing was every single thoroughbred we got in, I don't think there was ever one over five years old. Whenever we got a load of thoroughbreds in, the first thing that we'd always look for, um, anything that needed to be treated. So whenever a load would come in, us as, as the staff who cared about the animals, 
we'd go out and we'd walk through those intake pens, look for any cuts, any horses that are trying to lay down nonstop because in stressful times they shouldn't be. Um, so the lips on the horses, if they had it been burned or cut off, underneath their lip, it would be so swollen on the upper lip, you could just see the pink flesh showing right underneath their lip on some of them. Now we had one that got infected and he had nearly a whole half of his upper lip had to be removed. Um, it was pretty much ate off first though but it's very bloody when they cut the tattoo off instead of burning it. Um, burning it cauterizes it a lot more, but cutting it off, it was bloody. A lot of the times when we got those though, they were, they were scabbed up. So we didn't see them um, running blood or anything. We just saw, okay, there's blood in there and it's swollen, so something's going on. We couldn't feed them antibiotics, so they just had to stand out in the pasture and, or in a barn stall and hope that they make it through. A lot of them, a lot of the thoroughbreds we got in were shaved too in the middle of the winter. I mean, it was snowing on us and we're out here taking blankets off of some horses to get them on these thoroughbreds that didn't have any coats at all. Lots of people also bought horses uh, from the feedlot that were said to be registered or like an off the track, really well-bred horse. And once the people got the horse, they never received their papers or the horse was completely different and then say, okay, we'll send it back. I'm gonna have it euthanized and then I'll send you yours. No one's gonna send their horse back. If it's in perfect health, and well, they think it's in perfect health. They're not, they're not sending their horse back to die or finding out how horrible it is. No one ever does that. The feedlot makes it out with those nice horses while all these people are screwed all over the United States. None of them were local, which I imagine is the feedlot didn't want their house and barn burned down for screwing people over. Um, but I mean, they went everywhere, Louisiana, Alabama, Florida was probably the most often, Florida and Georgia. Um, they also went up to Montana a lot, Billings, Wyoming, because uh, they sold a lot there because they bought a lot there. So they, they did a lot up in Billings, Wyoming, which is where a lot of these self-proclaimed kill pens and feedlots, they, they buy in Billings a lot. Yes, yeah, so they'd buy those a lot, claim they're going to slaughter and the feedlot would sit and hold them until somebody wanted to buy them. And um, yeah, then they'd buy that horse that was never going to slaughter ever. Like all the other instances, they all they all end that way. Everybody buys the horse thinking it's going to slaughter and it's not, and then the kill pen just gets rich. People saw what I saw, <laughs> like they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't support the kill pen at all. Whoever every single buyer of each horse says they want to haul their horse that that's who is contracted to drive to the feedlot and pick up the horse and haul it out to them yeah so a lot of times it's going to be haulers with dirty loads and if it's not a dirty load it's going to be after they pick it up from the feedlot because they don't quarantine from the second that horse was bought it, it doesn't move any pen it's right where it's standing when it was sold until the hauler comes to pick it up and we move it up and before we'd move them up we'd have to bathe every horse off try to cover up anything on it send them out to them we did have one horse that had been sold. She was a Mustang, so she was sold. She was put out in a back pen that didn't have a round bell in it. It was one of the times where the owners of the feedlot just, whether they couldn't afford to or they were too lazy to, they did not buy any round bells. Hay was out for nearly all the pens. Um, and she stayed in there for about a week, just eating weeds, whatever she could with the other horses before she was bought. Um, and she was bought by somebody who was the first time, first time horse owner. Um, which is a lot of the people that fall into that trap. And as soon as they received the horse, thankfully they, they knew like, okay, I can't, I can't take care of this horse. This is beyond me. So they had to turn it over to a rescue. Now there was also another one. He was uh, once a big lick horse, they had said. He, he had very obvious severe EPM, but they just said, oh, he was trained like that in big lick. So they actually had sold him to a private home, um, but he went to a trader and about two months later he popped up in Cleburne um, but no one knew because Cleburne's not an online sale so a lot of, a lot of the traded horses end up there so many times Diclagerol was bought for him and I mean that's like $450 for 30 days down here and um, it'd been bought for him three times that I can count from donors and he was never ever given any of his EPM medication so from the day he came in to the feedlot and the day he left he had only gotten so much worse yeah, he was never treated. Yeah, so I thought like, oh, it's gonna be great. All the staff worked out. I can just volunteer because I don't have the time and I don't need the money. I wanted to help horses. So I went out there and the boss was like, yeah, these people wanted me to pay them 
$1,500 a week, you know, the feedlot was basically making me believe that the staff was just crazy for walking out. Um, I went out, that was the first time working there. I fed all the horses on my own completely. Um, the owner sat up in the barn, didn't do anything. Complete narcissism, you know, fluffing my fe feathers, letting me know I was amazing. Um, so of course I took the job and I, I was like, I'm helping horses, I'm working for somebody amazing, this is great. About a month into it, which a month felt like the whole six months because so much was, I mean, every single day we had right, two horses colicking over here, this horse just broke its leg, this horse is stuck in the fence, we got five loadouts, there was so much happening every day. We worked seven days a week, 16 hour days, every single day. There was no breaks, we didn't, we didn't take lunch, no dinner, no breakfast, unless you had time to go to the gas station down the road once every day. It wasn't, wasn't the life. And I was one of those people who thought like, yeah, the Kilpin's giving them a second chance. What, how amazing, these people buy all these horses, they waste all the money that they work for, for nothing, just to help these horses. Crazy, right? Yeah, it was crazy, I found out. I saw an ad for like day working horses. And so I was like, oh heck yeah, this is perfect. And it was at a kill pen and it said like, but don't, don't be worried. Like, we're not like everyone thinks, you know, we, I mean, they literally had a spill on there about how we give horses a second chance. Like we're the reason the numbers are lower. And so I thought how great. And I went to work there. Um, the week that I went to work there, I showed up for two or three days and I was like, all right, this is a little crazy. The people working here are crazy. Um, didn't put it together. And I saw them posting a few weeks later, how they had so many horses, everyone quit on them. The staff all walked out. So they had nothing to do. So I called and I was like, hey, I'll come volunteer. Like I got this other job, I'm working in an office. Um, I, don't, I don't have the time, but I'll volunteer when I can and I don't need money for it. Like I just want to help the horses. So it's like, welcome to the Kilpin world where they do everything completely different than any normal horse person ever. When I first came there, they didn't use feed buckets. Carry a bag of grain in, pour it in a line on the ground, let the horses fight over it. Um, so after I got there, I was like, we need feed buckets. Like they're, they're all gonna get stones. This isn't okay. They had feed buckets donated um, from a whole bunch of people, and we threw those out there. There's probably 10 to 12 in each pen. Each pen was about half an acre. We'd go in with the bag, fill each bucket up. That's, that's all we did. Every single bucket, every single horse got a full bucket. I'd finish at about 1 and have to start feeding dinner immediately if I wanted to be done by like 10 o'clock. Yeah, and then in winter, I blanketed all of those horses. If they had PSSM or insulin resistance, sucked for them. That's, that's all that we were able to give them. The stick that broke the camel's back for me finally quitting the feedlot was one of the horses that had came in there. It quickly became one of my favorite horses um, and it had lots of medical issues. We don't know what because we never, I wasn't there for its vet day so we don't know exactly what she was diagnosed with. Um, but she did receive medications and um, from the vet, they were prescribed to her that her buyer had paid for. Those medications were taken away from her and given to one of the personal horses who, of the person who owned the feedlot. I immediately went in, I got the proof of that exact instance and um, the next day I had let them know, I'm done, I'm moving out of state, <laughs> even though I wasn't. It was actually about two weeks before I had quit, threatened me. Um, all the other staff had quit and they had walked out. I was the only one that stayed because someone had to feed the horses and came in the tack room while I was putting some saddle pads up away in the corner and told me, hey, if you ever try to quit, walk out of here and not tell me like they did, I'm going to find you and I'm going to beat your bleeps. <laughs> so then I did quit. Uh, the feedlot found my address um, through the web sleuth that they had hired working for them. And so they show up, they drive by my house and then they'd call me and just threaten me. I called the sheriff, I gave the sheriff proof, um, but law enforcement still didn't do anything. And I, I really think the only reason they never came in was because like they know I'm very well armed and I can see down my driveway before they can see my house. They did not fall short on threatening or making sure, trying to make sure that I was scared and wouldn't say anything about them, um, which I think is why a lot of people don't say anything about them. They're, I mean, I worked there with five people and not one of them will speak up to this day to say anything. Always look at the person running it. Look at the things that they do and say. If they try to act like the boss 24 seven, um, a boss busy, some would say they're not, they're not a good person. They're very likely in it for the money. 
if they are constantly pushing horses out, they're, they're not rescuing because in order to rescue a horse, that means rehabilitation. So there, there's no rehabilitation if you're buying a horse one week and selling it the next day. Um, and another thing would be to look at auction records and look at your USDA and Animal Angels records because those are going to tell you who's actually shipping, how many horses are shipping, and they'll help you to see if what you're looking at is actually real or a scam like so many of the others see. I think the most important thing for people to know, if they actually want to slow down and stop the slaughter pipeline um, and help horses, either find something local, go to your local rescue who you know is doing it right. There are so many, I guarantee you can go to any county in the United States, there's going to be at least one or two horses that need help. And if that horse isn't got by somebody local, it's just going to go to auction and the kill buyers are going to get it. It's the only way they buy their horses, they've got to get to auction by someone, so if you get them beforehand. Not, none of that happens, and that's, that's a big thing we're like trying to push. The USDA guidelines are something a lot of people in the public supporting rescues and trying to help end slaughtered horses don't know about. They're public on the website, anybody can see them, and they list so many regulations that would show everybody all these feedlots that are claiming to ship that really don't. it just show you the proof and the lies, because they don't. There are trailer loads of horses that have been turned away because there's one blind horse in that trailer load. So you, you can't ship blind horses, yet you see blind horses going through these feedlots weekly. You can't ship horses with gaping wounds, yet they post a horse bleeding out from these feedlots and they say that if it's not bought by Tuesday, it's going to go down to Mexico. That's not the case, it'd get turned around on the trailer load. That's not USDA regulations at all the bleeding horse would get bought out by some a bleeding heart who cares about the horse and wants to help it and thinks they're saving it or it stands in the feedlot and doesn't get bought and passes on its own or it gets passed on to the next trader sometimes if the if the horse was worth it to them then they'd get it taken care of if the horse wasn't worth it and the feedlot's not going to make any money back on it they're not going to take care of that horse and if they can't pass it along it's going to stand in the back until it passes away on its own so they they won't pay for a shot they're not going to waste time going out there with a gun. They don't care about the animals at all, so. Allow me 